this is the Lion's Gate at Mycenae, the citadel, a Bronze Age citadel in the, in the Peloponnese of Greece. And I first went there in um, September of 1986, the first two weeks of my PhD. And I was thoroughly miserable. My PhD supervisor had arrived in Greece. I was working for the North. And, and I had all these fantastic sites that I wanted to show for my, my doctoral research. And, um, and he wanted to come here because he'd watched a television program on it. And so I reluctantly traipsed along behind him. My PhD was on limestone fault scarps in the Aegean. Uh, so indicators of, of active uh, faulting in the kind of geological record. And, uh, and as I arrived at the Lion's Gate, my heart went up because Paul Hancock, my supervisor, was looking at the Lion's Gate and I was looking to the left at the beautiful limestone fault scarp that bounds the, the lower half of that wall. So when Paul wandered around looking, talking about ancient Schliemann and the excavations, I, I spent my day on that, that fault scarp. And really, um, who would have thought that 35 years later I would be giving a talk, talking about how amazing the Bronze Age site of Mycenae is then? Um, but it's really the relationship between um, human development and the development of cities in the ancient world and earthquake faulting that is going to be at the heart of the, this talk and it's the heart of my, my interest really. Um, and what I'd like to do is to take you on a journey really around some of the big sites in the, in the Mediterranean region and, to, and look at what the legacy is of tectonics in general uh, active tectonics, active faulting is on some of the sites that we just take for granted as part of the human story. So I'm going to start somewhere slightly odd though, because the human story of course really starts in Africa. So early uh, humans, early hominids, Australopithecus, early homo are, are developed along um, both the, the East Africa rift system, but also in Southern Africa uh, area. And that map on the left shows not the hominid sites, but the seismicity. So you know, geologists amongst you will recognize the, the trace really of a, of a failed rift and of aborted third arm rift, the, the other two arms being at the um, Gulf of Suez and the Gulf of Aden. So we have a failed rift, a zone of lakes strung out and seismicity, active faulting all the way down there. And the image on the right um, comes from a paper that um, Jeff Bailey and, um, uh, well, uh, Jeff King, who's a seismologist, a nice collaboration between an archaeologist, Jeff Bailey, and, and uh, say a geologist, seismologist, Jeff King, specialist on earthquake faulting, did when they put together the story of the, uh, the, um, the early humans in Africa, because what they're shown on that right-hand side is a, a map of the early hominid sites, which are the clear circles some of the most famous hominid sites uh, in, in, you know, investigated, along with the roughness of the landscape. And the roughness of the landscape is a proxy for the extent to which there's been active and, and recent faulting. And that turns out in the view of, of the two Jeffs uh, and, and colleagues to be extremely important in shaping the way that early humans evolved in that, that region. And in particular, what we see here is this notion, really, that, that this is East Africa rifts. Uh, before you, you can see a few volcanoes popping up there amongst you. You can see the fault scouts beautifully shown in this digital elevation model. But the result is this complex topography of sedimentary basins, topographic barriers, different scales. And this diversity, this great landscape diversity, is geodiversity, essentially, brings these different concentrations of plant foods and animals, of shores of lakes and rivers and drinking water. Um, and so, and alongside that, nearby lava flows, fault scarps, river terraces. Lava flows, of course, are really important for some of the earliest tools and particularly some of the areas which have obsidian lava flows. And so that was important in that context. But the fault scarps appear to have been important too because they break the landscape up, they fragment it and they allow the creation of these very different habitats. And in one of the arguments that is made then is that one of the paradoxes is how come this, this strange hominid species that comes down from the forest starts to walk on two legs, so this bipedalism, and then manages 
to really flourish in this grand landscape. And the argument that the, um, they make in these papers is that it's very unlikely that this bipedal omnivore would have actually been successful in, in the flat savanna plains where they had to compete with much faster game, moving at vast, at really fast speed in large, at large numbers. Much more likely was the tactical advantage they gained in the fragmented landscape of these fault scarps and narrow ravines, etc., an area where they could they could hunt prey, they could sneak up on it, they could corral it and wrangle it, herd it, and and so here and in uh, later on in other parts of the world that I'll talk about, the the chances of actually domesticating in some cases some wild animals, uh, horses and things like that would probably happen not in the flat plains, but actually in these rugged uh, foothills that are tectonic foothills nearby. So the, the various earliest origins then of humans are in harmony or in association with active faulting uh, landscapes. As we look further north, as humans come out, they come out um, probably around about 120,000 years of the sea level, as the sea level starts to drop, moving across the, uh, the Red Sea into Arabia and then the coastal route northwards and, in, and around. And the coastal route northwards takes up and, and ends up in this area here, which is in the northern part of the Arabian Peninsula, where the Arabian plate is pushing, colliding with the Anatolian plate. This is a, a region that Yildrim knows very, very well. Um, and what we see here is um, earthquakes that define the Dead Sea Fault that's coming up uh, from, from the south and meeting a, another plate boundary structure, the East Anatolian uh, Fault Zone. You can see, as I say, all that seismicity running along it. But you can also see just from the shades of brown, really, the rugged terrain that occurs at that meeting point between the flat Arabian plain and the Anatolian plate, where these ruffled uplands start to, to form. And this turns out to be a really important area in that underneath where that red circle is, is, for example, the area where we think that wheat first became uh, domesticated. So einkorn wheat, the DNA fingerprinting is located it to that, a specific um, uh, plain area, plain that's been circled um, near San Urfa. And associated with that, at Golbeki Tepe, we have the, the oldest known temple religious site in the world. And so the idea is that the two are connected, that, that the basically, Either way, it's hard to tell which happens first. Either people congregated in this area for religious reasons and built this great temple, and in doing so also managed to take advantage of, uh, of um, domesticating the, the natural grasses, the, the wheats that were there, or more likely that this was an area that actually managed to, to, um, to exploit this, this uh, genetic uh, aberration in the wheat that allowed them to be planted again which allowed uh, permanent agriculture, which therefore gave a settled community that actually then was able to express itself in religious form. But either way, you can argue that this particular place, again, not on the flat plain, not in the mountains, but in these ragged borderlands between the two, is the birthplace of the earliest uh, kind of civilization, the very roots of civilization. And it's a, it's a thought that's been developed um, by others, in particular by Eric Force, he's uh, got his book about the influence of tectonics on civilizations, whereby if we look back at the Alpine Himalayan zone, what we see that top map um, just shows in the shades of brown, the seismic strain rate release across that whole plate boundary collisional uh, belt. The blue is the modern cities uh, that we're so associated with. But in the, in the red boxes are the big lethal earthquakes that's happened in the past. So we can see that that is a, a very uh, a kind of fatal corridor of geological collision that's now home to some of the biggest cities on the planet. But going back 10,000 odd years or so, um, what we see, or certainly into the early Holocene, we see these are the areas where the big civilizations emerge albeit along river systems, particularly like the Nile, but many of the river systems, Mesopotamia and the Harapan and even in, in China, are river systems that are coming out of these, these uh, foothills, these tectonic foothills. And if we go to the other graph shows the catching it in the Bronze Age, the Bronze Age Empire, those empires 
that are either located along these huge river systems like the Nile, or they're, they're located along these tectonic corridors. Um, and the reason for that, I think, is very similar, I would argue, to the reasons that we heard about from, um, from East Africa, which is this fragment, fragmented landscape where we've got uplands that are allowing areas where you can have settlements, then you've got coastal, or you've got um, sedimentary plains filled with alluvial soil, very good for agriculture. Your fault lines run through it, which are provide pathways for spring lines and waterway. And so it, it gives you, I folks ironically give you the, the key ingredients you need for life to take off in these rather kind of arid and uh, seasonally arid lands. So what I'm trying to convey is that in the big picture, faulting and tectonism provides a template that within which human civilization started to take, take root and, and develop. But of course, we think of fault lines in a very different way. We think of it in the, in the top diagram as you know, the, the seeds of destruction of, of many cities. Um, and that was not lost on the archaeologists that, that started developing and the, looking at these early studies, uh, cities, and particularly in the Bronze Age uh, Empire. This is Conor Sauce and this is uh, Sir Arthur Evans. And, um, and Sir Arthur Evans in 1926 famously experienced a, an earthquake, which was a, quite a, a strong, damaging earthquake. But he, in kind of classic, uh, kind of um, Victorian style, really, started to think about what that earthquake meant in terms of the site that he was interpreting. And in particular, he recognized the effects that the modern earthquake had on some of the archeological uh, remnants and realized that the, the shaking and overturning of some of the blocks came in a particular direction. And he suggested that would, could tell you the direction from which the seismic waves were coming. He also noticed destruction and, and started to think that these destruction horizons could be a way of actually understanding the occupational stratigraphy of, of sites. So for many people, Arthur Evans is the, if there is a father of, of archaeoseismology or earthquake archaeology, then it's Sir Arthur Evans. But particularly, uh, which was struck with him, was a, a building, we refer to the building of the fallen rocks, where he argued, as I say, this idea of, um, of seismic uh, toppling and then made the connection, now whether it's true or not, it's difficult to tell, but made the connection with the bull riding, with the idea that the frescoes depicting these young men riding the bulls as with the bull being the earthquake. And this is this people, this culture that was struggling to, to, um, to really survive in an area that was racked, racked by earthquakes. So in other words, earthquakes permeating into the very culture of the society rather than just affecting say, buildings. Um, that was that idea of earthquakes and in, in, um, in, in city in the development of the city and culture was taken a, a huge step forward um, a couple of decades later by Claude Schaefer, who mainly worked in Ugarit in um, in Syria, um, again another Bronze Age city, and it was it was Claude Schaefer who drew attention to the fact that at around about 1200 BC, in a period of about 50 years, almost all the major Bronze Age cities came to an end. So within a period of a few decades, um, one, one by one, they all more or less collapsed in strange enigmatic style. Um, and he argues, as is shown here, he says, my our inquiry demonstrated these periods were caused not by the action of man. The argument had been that um, the result of the end of the Bronze Age had come around from well, various things. Some people argued it was the, a new type of warfare, chariots, etc. But a very common one was the idea of the sea peoples that had come from the north, somewhere in the, the probably in the Black Sea area, swept through the Aegean and ended up having a final battle in, in Egypt. But actually, Schaefer was the one that that picked apart some of the, the archaeological detail and argued that actually it was an earthquake and a series of great or a great earthquake or a series of great earthquakes had actually destroyed all of this. Um, so this was a kind of catastrophism that captured the imagination really of, of people in that mid part of the 20th century. And it's been argued, but was rejected by archeologists completely in the second half of the, um, the 20th century and indeed People argue that Schaefer kind of contaminated archaeology really in that second half because people were looking for these catastrophic 
and theories always to explain the, explain away the demise of cities. But that notion of earthquakes has been reinvented really by Amos Noor, the seismologist in, um, uh, over at Stanford, who um, has kind of, again, brought back the idea in a kind of post-plate tectonic uh, setting by pointing out that many of the cities of the end Bronze Age lie along uh, tectonic boundaries, very active uh, kind of fault systems. And that you could argue that what you might get is rather than a, a, a kind of colossal global quake that does this, what you get is a series of really big earthquakes that rip along the plate, the multiple plate boundaries in a short period of time, a kind of seismic triggering. And the, the inspiration for this really comes from and a remarkable series of earthquakes that struck um, North Anatolia in, uh, in the 20th century. So um, you can see here, this is the North Anatolian fault line shown in the Black Sea just above. In 1912, there was a big earthquake in the very Western part, the Aegean section. Um, but in 1939, 26th of December, 1939, in the Anatolian East, huge earthquake, uh, magnitude 7.5 or so, 30,000 people killed in a relatively underpopulated area. So it was a really colossal earthquake. But then look out, 19, in 1939, 1942, 1943, 1944, then it skips back, it's missed out a little section, there's a smaller earthquake in 1951, and then it continues again, 1967, and then the earthquakes that you may remember in August and November of 1999. So work by... Um, uh, Ross uh, Stein and, and Jeff King and, and others, and I could bark, have published a, a classic paper where they looked at the stress coulomb modeling, stress modeling, and demonstrated that each of these faults, uh, ruptures triggered the next one, like a set of falling dominoes. And, and so the red area that's left is the only significant stretch of that plate boundary structure that is not ruptured in the 20th century. And that rupture, that area, is an area that will generate a magnitude 7.4 plus earthquake, and it's 10 kilometers from Istanbul, a city of 16 million people. And so that today is, a, an ex, is something that is waiting to happen as a result of this 20th century earthquake storm. However, I have to say that most people really don't accept the notion of that these colossal earthquake storms rip their way uh, through, and particularly the work of um, Sam and Jusserie and, and Manuel Sinterbin have recently been really looking again at this idea of the, the early Bronze Age and picking it apart. And, and more broadly, one of the interesting things about earthquakes is, that the, is the lack of legacy they have in the historical record. So we think of them as hugely destructive events. But in areas where we've got really long catalogues, where we know lots of earthquakes happened, and probably the best example is what I'm going to talk about next, classical Greece, um, you actually, you find them destroying cities, but you don't find them having huge cultural hiatuses. And it doesn't look as if it ends in the demise of whole civilizations in, in ancient cities. The point is that earthquakes are the same 2000 years ago as they are today. They strike an area, they cause partial devastation, but the people rebuild. That's where they're from. That's where their loved ones have died in the ruins. The ruins are there, they rebuild them. That's where their fields are. They, they patch them up and they continue with life. Um, and so earthquakes are a funny thing. They leave these enigmatic signs often in the archeological record. So uh, what we see on the left is uh, rotated column drums, Hephaestum Temple in Athens, which Galenopolis in the 1950s, a seismologist reckoned was evidence that Athens was not immune from earthquakes and could suffer from damaging earthquakes that would knock off, knock up the temple and um, cause the, the drums to shift. And it would take the September earthquake in 1999 to demonstrate to, to Greek seismologists that Athens was indeed an area that could be struck by damaging earthquakes when 150 people died. But on the right hand side, we see another enigmatic one. This is the um, war memorial in Kefalonia that, the, to the British uh, that was put up after the um, at the end of the war when, so 
the, the Italians were in charge of Catalonia and then uh, they'd surrendered. Germans came in. Then obviously when the, the British came in at the end of the war, they put this um, they put this memorial up. And then in 1953, we have a magnitude 7.3 uh, earthquake. Anyone who's who's written, uh, read uh, Captain Corelli's Mandolin knows that the earthquake takes pride of place in the historical account. Um, this is a photograph I found in a bookstore. It shows the uh, memorial um, damaged and all the blocks shifted, but that was fixed up within uh, a matter of, of, of months really. And if you go there now, you see it's perfectly, perfectly fine. So earthquakes leave a mark, but they're a tantalizingly subtle mark often. So I don't believe um, that earthquakes have this huge effect on, on human history. And I really like this quote by Charles Richter, who says, uh, ancient accounts of earthquakes do not help us very much. They're incomplete and accuracy is usually sacrificed to make the most of a good story. And I agree with that. I think that um, earthquakes are not much help to us in the earthquake world, because usually what we do is we find earthquakes we already knew about. They don't really help us with the seismic hazard. They don't really help us in any you know, systematic way with, uh, with, with the paleo seismology in, in ancient earthquakes. Um, but they do make a good story. And I think that what I'm going to tell now is, is a, a really about looking at the other side of them, which is what is the story that they have for our, our um, kind of human connections to, uh, to the land and to faults. And to do that, I'm going to concentrate on my backyard that uh, Yildrum talked about. This was the area that I worked on right in the middle there, that narrow peninsula, the Perahora Peninsula, which is where the Gulf of Corinth is. That's where I worked on my PhD. And this landscape that you see in front of you is earthquake country. The, virtually everything you see is defined by earthquake faulting. The rises of the, the mountain, the down throwing into the sedimentary plains, the, the down throwing into the, the um, inundated gulfs, are all affected by active normal faulting in an extensional area. It's been pulled north-south, extended north-south, as Arabia collides and subducts underneath the Aegean plate. And so what we see then is we see a, 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 this kind of very indented coastline of, of Greece on one side and Western Turkey the other, defined by these big normal fault escarpments or this extensional tectonic regime greatest extension in the center where the, the, the land has been extended so much that it's actually subsided below sea level. Um, but as I say, then the, the, there was normal faults extending into the, the hinterlands, producing the gulfs of, of, the, uh, of Greece and the, the inland um, uh, sedimentary basins of Western Turkey, again, an area that Yildirim knows extremely well. And I've shown and read really lots of the ancient cities. There's lots of ancient cities. That's just a, a few of them. So the first thing you can see is that the ancient cities uh, of, of Greece and Asia Minor were associated, you know, there were lots of faults around, lots of cities, so we shouldn't really be expecting too much. On the right, we have some of the most spectacular ones. This is a, a normal fault that's been exhumed for gravels. It's uh, near Evia, just north of, of uh, Athens. And that scarp there, that fault plain, is probably, I don't know, many hundred of seismic events that has moved the quaternary gravels against the, the limestone um, rock, because this is limestone country. And that's important because limestone fault scarps are very um, enduring in the landscape. Now, this is the Caparelli fault. I did my PhD partly on this fault. This isn't my slide. This has been done with all fancy equipment, GPS and uh, cosmogenic dating more recently. But I spent weeks camped just above there studying this fault, which ruptured in an earthquake in 1981 half a meter displacement. So that fault scarp is probably six or seven earthquake displacements over time. But you can see it's still left this very prominent expression in the landscape, a vertical, near vertical wall cutting right across uh, at the landscape. Which brings me back to my scene, because now you can see on the left that limestone fault that I got so excited about developed, um, so built on, by the Mycenaeans with the cyclopedian, cyclopedian walls, these huge blocks um, to form the, the, um, the city walls and the famous uh, Lion's Gate. And this brings me to the first important point about fault scarps uh, is that they're good to build on. They create topography. Now here's Mycenae from the air. 
you'll see right in the middle of the bottom there is the, the fault scarp that you can see going up towards the lion's gate. You can see the stairwell going into the, the point where the walls kink around. And that fault continues on into uh, the lion's gate is not displaced. It might be worthwhile going back there. It's not displacement. So that was built on top of the fault and the fault has not moved since that, that was built. So it was built as a, as a passive structure. The fault itself continues in there and you can trace it in various places in the, the, the cult center, the religious center of, of Mycenae, which is shown. But there's actually a fault on the other side as well. Um, and where it says Sacred Spring, there's a fault line that runs up that, that um, northern side and cuts across onto the, um, the hill in the far side. You might be able to see the juxtaposition of the flat plain against the limestone. And that was important because the Sacred Spring was a spring that you could access from inside the walls by going in underneath in the, the um, what we call the, the foot wall of the fault, intersecting the fault, and that's where they access the water. So the, the site could be besieged and people could think they've got them trapped, but actually the Mycenaeans would be able to access water, fresh water from the inside, thanks to the fault. So this is a really nice image to highlight what the benefits are of an active fault landscape. It builds topography, topography in which you can put your citadel, your acropolis, but it also is pathways for water and you need water. So it's a place for springs. So probably, um, although it sounds perverse to say it, you know, if you were wanting to build a city, you would do, could do a lot worse than looking for act, an active fault to put your city right on top of. But I want to take it a little bit further than that and push this, see how far we can push it. Because I wanted to take you to Delphi, which is the omphalus, the belly button of the ancient world. So this was a place where, where you had a, an oracle, a Delphic oracle, which was regarded as one of the most reliable oracles of the multiple oracles in the ancient world. And, and, uh, and many people would consult it. The famous one was King Crozius from Lydia, who wanted to know whether he should uh, invade Persia. Um, and so he road tested a whole set of, of uh, oracles and decided Delphi was the best one. So he, he went to Delphi and he, he asked, um, through the priest of the, the Pythia, the, the priestess, should I invade Persia? And the answer came back, if you invade Persia, you will destroy a great empire. And so he invaded Persia, he was obliterated, and his empire was destroyed. So there was always that little hint of um, duplicity or ambiguity, let's say, in these things. But this was the most famous site in the ancient world. And you can see it's an extraordinary landscape. But what we're looking at geologically beyond that limestone hill is, that, is essentially limestone fault scarp. You can see the amphitheater here. And I'm going to talk more about the um, Temple of Apollo in just a second. But here we see uh, Delphi excavated by the, the French really over the last couple of hundred years. And that map at the top shows us really the, the uh, fault lines. Um, so it's a, a, a normal a fault escarpment that's running broadly east-west, comes across, there's a kink, and what we're looking at in the photograph is that kink before it, it then um, jogs along and continues at a lower, a lower level. And we're going to highlight two things. We're going to highlight, I'm going to show you a minute where it says Athena. I'll show you the, um, the uh, sanctuary of Athena, and then we'll come back to showing the uh, site of Apollo. But essentially what you're looking at there is a segmented normal fault system. So any structural geologists among you, it's a, it's a dilational jog on a, a huge uh, extension of normal fault system. So let's go to the uh, temple of, uh, of Athena, slightly lower level. Now for some people, particularly Luigi Picardi, who works in Italy, has worked a lot on this. Luigi feels that this is the site of the ancient oracle because it's the Mycenae, it's the oldest part of the site. And, and therefore, uh, he argues that's where it would have been, uh, been located. Um, that's not the consensus view, but the point is that what we see there is a, a sanctuary, a sacred sanctuary site, where a fault scarp has actually cut all the way through it. It was, rupt it was reactivated most recently in the uh, 373 BC earthquake, a very famous earthquake that I can talk a lot more about, but I'm not going to. Um, which, which struck the southern side of the Gulf of Corinth, but also caused widespread devastation, antithetic faulting uh, here. Now, here's what's interesting. Not that the earthquake ruptured through the site, that is interesting. Not that it destroyed the site, but rather that the rebuilding of that temple sanctuary 
was in exactly the same place. In fact, you can see the round temple, which is shown in the photograph there, being built right on within a meter or so 